it sounds like an AI prompter, right? Write me Indiana Jones, but with a shark. AI is going to turn us all into paper clips and may, render the world in, uh, incapable of, of supporting human life. To which I say, I think you're talking about limited liability companies. And to the extent that you are afraid of it, maybe you're afraid of it for the same reason that science fiction stories have always resonated with us. That making up stories about things that might happen in the future allows us to surface our fears and aspirations for what's going on now. And so I think that there is good reason to be very afraid of AI. I think that like our bosses want to fire our asses and replace us with computer programs, and they don't care if they work, right? How many times have we called an interactive or voice, voice response system that replaced a human operator and gone, 17, no, 17, <laughs> one seven, 17, operator, operate, 17, right? We know that our bosses don't care if the machine works because all the boss cares about is that in a condition of heavy market concentration, there's nowhere else to go. And so you're just going to sit there on hold waiting to talk to EasyJet about your missing bags for as long as it takes. And they don't have to pay the, the wage bill of, a, of an operator. I live in Burbank, California now. There's picket lines all over my neighborhood from striking screenwriters. When they describe their relations with producers, with, uh, with studio execs, it sounds like an AI prompter, right? Write me Indiana Jones, but with a shark. <laughs> Make the shark a baby shark, right? Can you add a cute kitten in the second act? This is just like, write me instructions for removing a sandwich from a VCR in the style of the King James Bible, Hollywood edition, right? A lot of American cultural production is like this, right? It's mass produced, very cheaply, done by a simple cooking recipe, and this is stuff that can be replaced. And I think this is a very big opportunity because it means it frees up human creativity to do something meaningful. And it's not that we are going to produce less, it's not that we're going to starve. We still need to figure out how to distribute and allocate, but this is always a problem of the economy that is somewhat orthogonal to the ability to produce. I grew up in Eastern Germany, we were a very equitable society, but we didn't produce shit. So uh, the, our standard of living was much, much lower than the US, which is an extremely broken society. But for a f uh, country of 400 million people, I don't know any that is more livable at this scale. Right? It's very hard to organize a big system. AI now is, is, of course, a topic that lets us hallucinate our favorite thing, like the uh, fight between in-group and out-group, my favorite political activism against capitalism and former communism and so on. You uh, can all project this in there. Uh, the psychologist Robert Keegan from Harvard has this idea of personality development in stages. And uh, most people are in stage three, where they form opinions based on assimilating them from the environment. At stage four, you discover what's true and false independently of others, and you get agency over your beliefs, you become rational. And at stage five, you discover how identity is constructed and who you can be and why people are different people than you. And uh, this is very few people get to this stage, very good therapists get to stage five usually. But uh, all the AI safety discussion it seems to be happening along these three stages. Stage three, people are scared that the AI has bad opinions because we form our morality from other people, right? We are, if the AI is going to be racist and sexist, we are all going to be racist and sexist. This is horrible. We need to make sure that the AI is only spouting correct opinions. If you're a rationalist, you're not worried. If the opinion is wrong, the AI will prove that it's wrong, right? Uh, you just need more data, a better model, and so on. But you're worried about utility function. What if the AI is turning everybody into a paperclip? That would be horrible, right? But if you're at stage five, you just wonder, is the AI going to be enlightened fast enough? Right? And that's, this is what you should be concerned about. So the question is, can you imagine a system that is slightly different than ChatGPT? Because I'm not quite sure what the boundaries of that is. Maybe it gets better at AI research than AI researchers, right? And can walk the rest of the way, even though it's boot forcing it. But uh, it's clearly not learning like we are. It's getting coherent in the limit. The more data you feed in, the more coherent the output is. And if you give it the entire internet, it's like 99% coherent. Right, because it ne can never get all the data. But our human minds work very differently. We, as babies, start out to take in only stuff that makes us more coherent. Mm -hmm. right? The stuff that makes you less coherent, you ignore it until you can put it in. So it's a different loss function. But maybe we can put that loss function into GPT-5, uh, and it's going to converge to coherence first, and then learn style and intricacies much later, like we do. Right? So it's possible that we can build systems like this. Maybe the paradigm is different. Maybe you should start out building a cat. Let's build a really decent cat. Cats are conscious all right, right? They are somewhat social, and uh, they can be quite dominating, but we don't need to be scared of cats. And uh, because they also try to fit in, right? If maybe we build such a thing as a paradigm, something that is self-organizing, something that is conscious, that is trying to become coherent, 
and uh, try to imitate some of those principles from nature and try to figure out how they work. Yeah. Yeah. So just on that point, like, well, why haven't people tried to build a build a cat yet? I mean, these were programs in AI robotics in the 1980s. People say, okay, we're aiming too high. We need to go back. Can we build a grasshopper? Can we build a robot with the sensory motor skills of an animal that is not considered that intelligent? And what they run into is what's known as Moravec's paradox. It's much easier to replicate in machines the skills that people take to be difficult and indicative of us as like the top level of intelligence in the living world. So chess was done fairly early, logic, problem solving, maths, and now language, people can do in machines, language production, people can do in machines. But self-driving cars are not here. So the things that animals do really easily, just getting about their world, sensing, acting fast, adaptively, and intelligently, when I say grasshopper flies, they act intelligently in their environment, they're much, much harder to mechanize. And I think this is a, there's a philosophically deep reason why this is. This is one of the factors that leads me to that view that there's something about the connection between intelligence and being alive that the AI research program is missing out on. And sort of what LLMs and other AIs have done is kind of try, try to get that convergence with this you know, something that people do, na a narrowly defined cognitive capacity like sentence completion, and you can get in at that top level, but without all of that ground level foundation coming up of access to the world through sensory motor engagement, then it's not going to expand out into something which understands an environment and gracefully makes its way around an environment, can encompass all kinds of different information and points of view and can be creative, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, one thing about machines I was also sort of prompted to say there is that all technologies exist within an, e within an ecosystem that human beings build for them. So the fact that these machines are very narrowly intelligent and in some way just single-minded and stupid, but they're still very functional because we build the system around them which can utilize their power and kind of patch up for their deficiencies. And the very fact that culturally we're in this environment in which, yeah, producers just want the kind of stuff that a machine could do anyway. It's like, well, yeah, we're part of the way towards automation anyway because of how we've already organized labor. And so in that context, the machine will give you all you want because you've generated the environment already in which the machine is just, you know, waiting to be delivered. But then we have to ask ourselves, is that the kind of world we want? Like, do we want our world to be the perfect ecosystem for machines as opposed to us with all of our different quirky ways which are not very machine-like? I think that this is very well said. You know, I, I, I think that um, some people mistake science fiction for a predictive literature as though my colleagues are sort of pocket Nostradamuses telling you what's going to come in the future. And I think that, that there is nothing more dismal than the idea that the future can be predicted because it implies that there's no role for human agency or human choice. It's just another way of repeating Thatcher's axiom that there is no alternative or, you know, the, the Vogon uh, abandon, uh, uh, resistance is futile or Dante saying abandon hope all you enter here, we get to decide how our technology is used. This is not a, a foregone conclusion. Will we have GPT-5? Will it be owned by the people who currently own GPT-4, people who have a company called Open Artificial Intelligence, which is neither open nor artificial nor intelligence? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.